Hello, guys. Thank you for still being here with me. And I think it's, uh, it's great for me to discuss how to make smart contracts run faster and safer just af after a great panel of scalability. So smart contracts are great innovation. Uh, it, it enables a truly decentralized way to automate processes, establish trust, and transfer value. But let's all begin with something fun and simple. This is a game. This is a game running on Ethereum today. Uh, at one point, it was the most popular decentralized game running on Ethereum. It's called Ethereum Moon. So players of this game can capture or buy monsters called Moons, train them, let them battle, and these Moons will improve themselves. So this is all great, except that at one time, users had to spend a lot of money just to get to level four. You know, for players' games, we understand level four is really just an initial stage. So what happened was the network was congested. So that comes to this scalability problem that we are all familiar with now. So if the global network of, let's say, Ethereum can only process about 15 transactions a second, and then all applications, all users sharing you know, the same bandwidth will have to compete for that limited resources every second. And as a result, people sometimes had to pay higher gas fees just to get their transactions processed earlier than others with higher priority. So that is a scalability problem with today's blockchain. That is a problem we have just discussed with the panel, and that's something I'm going to discuss as well here. So to improve the scalability of blockchains, public blockchains today, there are several interesting and I would say even useful, effective uh, mechanisms. And then the first one is something called delegated consensus or you know, typically delegated proof of stake. So what that means is if we think about why blockchains are slow in the first place, or slower than we expect them to be, it's because we have a lot of redundancy, which can yield resilience and security, decentralization, whatever, on the blockchain. But this redundancy means you know, for the same piece of work, maybe a task, a transaction, or some smart contract function to be executed, that task is actually replicated by the entire blockchain network, which can you know, have, let's say, thousands of nodes. You know, and, and then all these nodes have to do the same thing. Eventually, they talk to, uh, talk to themselves and try to figure out what's the agreement, what's the consensus they want to reach to. And this process definitely is slower than just say like me making the decision myself. So just to sort of have a better balance there, instead of letting every single node or every single computer in the blockchain network um, make, make the decision and, and discuss themselves, we can actually delegate such decision making to a much smaller number of nodes or computers. And then let's say we only have 10 nodes who are sort of given the power to make decisions. We can make the process of consensus much faster. And as a result, we can make the throughput of the blockchain much higher. I it's except that there is a small caveat because the smaller number of nodes that are involved in the decision making process, the higher performance the blockchain will get. But at the same time, the, the co more concentration, the higher concentration of power is sort of established among this small number of nodes. So that's something for us to think about. And then another approach is under the sort of same line of thoughts because running transactions or smart contracts on the blockchain is expensive. Expensive you know, in terms of performance, expensive in terms of the gas cost. So what we can do is uh, bring some of the transactions that are less critical in terms of security and decentralization and run them on a separate infrastructure. It can be a completely separate cloud server. It can be something that's still connected to the blockchain in some way, like state channels. So we have different state channels. I think such off-chain solutions provide a sort of a great complementary solution to the on-chain scalability. But at the end of the day, if we have many state channels, um, they become popular, many users. They still need a faster blockchain to synchronize with. Otherwise, you know, the on-chain scalability can still be the performance bottleneck by itself. So that's why we are very excited about sharding. So why sharding is so exciting? Because if we can do sharding properly, it can enable a way to provide almost linear scalability without compromise on security and decentralization. So what that means is when your network is smaller, let's say only less, less than 2,000 nodes, you can process about uh, 1,200 transactions a second. And then when you double the size of the network in terms of how many nodes are there in your network, you can actually double the, uh, double the throughput of your network as well. 
So that's exciting because when you just start your blockchain network, you know, it's, it's more for experiments, and then you don't have too many users, too many, many apps. But then it's more about when you have more users adopting your blockchain in the near future, can you sort of keep up the throughput uh, and grow as much as your network grows? So that's an interesting uh, sort of pr uh, prospect of, of sharding. Uh, part of the Zilliqa team has started working on sharding for public blockchains back in 2015. And over the years, we see many more great projects starting to work on this almost same, uh, same problem or similar problems at the same time. But why so long? Why took us so long, several years, just to work on sort of one technical problem? Because sharding is hard. And why sharding is hard? There are several fundamental challenges that we have to sort of address if we want to do sharding properly, as I put it. So the first aspect is security. If you think about sharding, right, at the high level, without getting into the details, it's about dividing a large network into smaller parts. And then there seems, there seems to be a tendency that the security of the larger network may be also reduced in some way just to that smaller group. That smaller group can be just you know, 20 nodes, 50 nodes, 100 nodes, 200 nodes. So that's undesirable. And we have to make it right so that even when we divide the network, we are dividing and conquering to solve the problems, we are not dividing the security. And then the second challenge has to do with decentralization. Because if we lose decentralization in the process of sharding, uh, you know, we just lose the beauty of sharding. Because otherwise, you can use many other solutions. You can use state channels. You can use you know, delegated proof of stake to solve the same problem without getting into such complication. Because we all know sharding is complicated. And then the third aspect is about how do we run smart contracts on sharding? Because the moment we get beyond processing uh, just simple payment like transactions in the sharding network, the complexity just goes up, and I'll show you why. So all these three challenges actually are all related to one fundamental problem that sharding solves. This is the question about what goes to which shard. If you think about this, it's all about number one, when you have different nodes and computers in the network, how do you divide, how do you assign these nodes into different shards, basically different groups of nodes? That's the first question. And then with that, you have to address the second question, which is about after you have a sharded network, how do you determine uh, which transaction or which smart contract function goes to which shard to be processed? So that's the second question in terms of sharding. And at Zilliqa, we address the first aspect, which node goes to which shard, with this architecture. So it can get, can get very complicated, but at the very high level, we use a secure proof of work scheme to uh, defend this scenario called cyber attacks. So basically in cyber attacks, all these malicious nodes can come in to join the network, flood the network um, by saying I have many nodes. So although I may only have just one node, I can say I have hundreds of thousands. And then in that way, the malicious nodes may be able to outvote all the good guys in the network. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is, we use the result of the proof of work derived at this process to randomly uh, sort of sample the nodes and divide them into different groups. And we make sure that each group will have at least, for example, 600 nodes, a large enough number to ensure decentralization. So the exact number 600 can be tuned. You know, we are still finalizing the, the final parameters for our mainnet. But you, know, you get the idea. So that means at every step, at every single step of the protocol, from beginning to the end, at least 600 nodes will be involved in decision making. So that ensures decentralization throughout the whole protocol. So that sort of solves the first problem, you know, which node goes to which shard. And then that gets to the second and more complicated problem. Which transaction or which smart contract will be processed in which shard? Again, let's start with something slightly simpler. This is just a simple payment-like transaction. This is uh, two accounts, this is about two accounts. Alice is sending $5 from her account balance to another account owned by Bob. And then let's say we have two shards in the network for, for the sake of argument. And then how do we assign? Should this um, transaction go to the first shard or second shard? You know, you may say it doesn't matter. You know, we, we just randomly assign such transactions to different shards so that they're, they're, they're even. So what happens with sort of a purely random assignment is that we may have double spending. Because imagine the case where Alice creates one transaction, paying $5 to another user, Bob. But then at the same time, this same user, Alice, also creates a transaction to send $5 again back to her own account. So what happens if we just uh, sort of allocate transactions purely randomly? 
So there's a high chance that these two transactions will be allocated to two different shards, and then they will be processed in parallel. And then both may be accepted, while Alice only has $5 in the first place in her initial balance, and then that's double spending. Okay, how do we solve this problem? If we look at the pattern of such transactions, what we can see is that it seems like you know, the balances of the sender and the uh, recipient uh, are changed during this process, but then the sender is the only one who can sort of initiate that kind of change. So if that's the case, maybe we should just shard such transactions according to the sender, according to the sender's address. So here's what happened. If we shard such transactions according to the sender only, that's good because you know, you, in case there's such a uh, set of transactions where they are, they are all from the same user, they will be sharded into the same shard, and the double spending attack will not happen because you know, only one of these two transactions will actually go through because we know Alice only has $5 in the first, first place. So that's all good with payment-like you know, simple transactions. Now let's move on to smart contracts. Here we have a simple smart contract, which has just you know, one token to be claimed, to be bought and owned, basically. And then what if two users calling into the same, con uh, same smart contract at the same time? So, and then we are still following the original thought that we were shot according uh, to the sender address. And then there's a high chance that these two transactions will be allocated into two separate shards because they belong to two different senders. And then who eventually owns this token? Whether it's Alice or Bob, because you know, they seem, seem to be living in different worlds, and then in each of their own worlds, they have uh, purchased and claimed the ownership of the token. So that is sort of the conflict we have to address. So just take, it, take one step back. In the payment like simple transactions, only the balances, account balances of the sender and the recipient can be changed. And then the sender is the only one who can sort of initiate that kind of change. But then if we go to smart contract scenarios, things are more complicated. So number one is all the states of smart contracts can be changed by anyone. And then the second thing is um, any account can actually initiate that change without knowing you know, what's happening with other accounts. So it seems like we need a slightly different approach to tackle these two different scenarios. But just before I present you know, what could be the solution for that, let's think, think about one sort of simple solution to address this. So we know that when smart contracts are processed by different accounts and then by different shards, we may have conflicts and then that's undesirable. Can we do something as simple as say whenever one shard processes one smart contract, let's just lock it. You know, let's lock it until the next epoch, until the next block is being generated. So that seems fine. I mean, the only issue with that solution is that we are sort of limiting the parallel computing or parallel processing in that sense to a, to a large, larger degree, which is not what we want with sharding because in sharding it's all about parallel processing. So let me just pr present one solution that we have developed uh, and, and that is going to be included in our manual launch. So this is about more deterministic ways to resolve such conflicts when we process smart contracts in different shards. So remember, we, have, we actually have some insights. So for different types of transactions, we roughly know how to process them, especially for the simple ones. So the first step we take is to divide them into different types, different categories. So the first type is the simplest case where you just have a payment-like transfer. Uh, from one user account to another user account, no smart contract involved. And then for the second category, we take one step further, where we have one user account sending some tokens or calling some transactions um, to, to an, I think you know, no, no token in involved, it's just calling a simple function to a smart contract. So that's the second case. And then we know, like, you know there are other cases, and then we just categorize all the other cases into type three. So this enables us to sort of process these different transactions in different ways. So for the first type of transactions, we know, we just need to look at the sender address because that's the only thing that can change, uh, possibly change the states. So we look at the address of sender. For example, if we only have two shards, we can look at the last bit of the sender address and then you know, just shard transactions according to that bit. And then for the second category, we know that we cannot just alone uh, rely on the sender address because uh, if we have two senders calling to the same smart contract, we have a problem as well. So what we do there is to look at both the sender and recipient addresses. And if they follow certain patterns, uh, that's easily sort of, um, uh, that's easily uh, shardable, then we shard accordingly to both the sender and the recipient address. But if they don't follow that pattern, we just you know, throw them to a special shard. And then for all the sort of more complicated cases in category three, 
we simply throw them to this special shark. So here is one solution. I don't know whether you like it or not, but here seems to be one issue, which is, hey, how many transactions are we still processing in the sharded architecture? Are we throwing almost 99% you know, of all the transactions into the third category and then processed in one special shard? And then there's no parallel processing. So that's, that's the fundamental question to, to answer here. I think according to our analysis and some initial experiments so far, most of the transactions will still be processed in the more sharded way. That means they belong to category one and category two. Of course, there will be more transactions belonging uh, to category three as much as we enlarge the network. And on the other hand, for all category three, if you look into the details, they can possibly be further divided into something like category one and category two. And the reason we are not addressing that, although we have some initial ideas, is that the complexity will go up because it may inevitably involve some fine way, uh, some fine way of locking mechanisms. So that's why we will go ahead with this approach, which I think is the most efficient way available so far uh, of running smart contracts on the, on the shared blockchain. But we have something in pipeline immediately after our mainnet that we are going to improve. The first thing is to further optimize the category three um, transactions for smart contracts, D further dividing them, maybe adding some smart ways to lock them so that they can be processed uh, in, in the sharded architecture first before aggregated in the, in the uh, special shard. And then if we can possibly have some hint from the developers of the smart contracts, so this is a very similar idea to other blockchains, you know, such as our chain, for example. And then we can, we can definitely be better at dividing um, such um, smart contract transactions because we, we got some hint from, from the creators of them. And then the third thing, if the clients who are interacting with the nodes of the blockchain can you know, be more heuristic and give us some, some hints as well, and then that can improve the process of the uh, sharding as well for smart contracts. So we are just at the beginning of this exciting journey to uh, run smart contracts much faster on a sharded blockchain. But simply being faster is not enough. And here is why. Because although smart contracts are sort of innovation, you know, it's, it's basically a relatively new thing, we already, have, we already had serious incidents in the past. We had the DAO hack, we had this uh, multi-sig wallet incident last year. People lost money or people's money got you know, frozen in, in the smart contracts. If we look slightly deeper into the details, you know, you can ignore the code if you, if you cannot see it. But at the very high level of the, of the DAO incident, what happened was uh, they have this you know, interesting mechanism of fundraising. So everyone will donate, but, they, but at the end of the day, if the fundraising uh, did not reach the goal, every donor can actually go and, and claim the original amount of money they have donated back. So that's a good mechanism, except that when the donor goes to call that smart contract, to claim the donation back, what if the caller is a smart contract? And then if that smart contract is malicious, it can actually hijack that control flow. And then at the end of the day, that statement never gets you know, moved to the next statement. That statement can be executed again and again and again. So that malicious smart contract uh, end up drawing almost infinite number uh, amount of money from the smart contract in the DAO hack incident. So that's not nice. And then in the multi-state contract incident, it's it's even more interesting where they have exposed a function to the public and everyone can call that function to become the owner. And you know, as you understand, you are like you know, super powered. Once you become the owner, you can just draw money out of that contract. And in recent months, we are seeing also um, sort of more integer overflow attacks where once you can make a super large integer, it can become zero sometimes. And then that will give you another avenue to draw money without deducting any, any amount from your own account. So these are sort of some of the incidents of smart contract incidents uh, we are seeing. And then at Zilliqa, we made sort of a, a, a very conscious decision in prioritizing security over anything else when we designed our own smart contract language, Zilla. So I think it's easy to say we prioritize security, but what that means is really uh, from the design of the smart contract, we made it simpler in terms of being non-Turing complete. And then I'll exp explain what that means in, in reality in a minute. But that gives us the ability to sort of formally verify such smart contracts. Formally verifying means you can write mathematical proofs to show that certain properties will always hold. For example, in the DAO hack, we can write math mathematical proofs if the smart contract uh, were written in Scylla, saying that, okay, when you uh, refund money to donors, it, the money will always be refunded to the right hands with the right amount, things like that. 
So from the structure, we have eliminated the possibility that smart contracts can interact with other smart contracts during the process of their execution. So you can interact with other smart contracts, but you can only do so at the end of your uh, execution, after you have finished your processing. So at the structure level, we have eliminated the possibilities of having another DAO hack-like incident. And then, uh, of course, internally, uh, the Scylla smart contract uh, will not allow anything like integer overflow or, or, or underflow. And then here's one interesting aspect about being uh, non-Turing complete, because people always ask us, what do you mean by being non-Turing complete? So what that essentially means is we know that the program will definitely terminate. And what that manifests in the smart contract design is that, for example, we will not allow the developers to write in finite loops. Instead, you have to write structured ways like recursions um, if you want to have anything like loop. So essentially, you can achieve the same goal, but it avoids the possibility that smart contracts may, may never terminate you know, if we don't consider the gas mechanism, for example. So these are some of the security features of the Scylla smart contract language we provide. And this is just one example where we can write that kind of uh, mathematical proof using Coq, which is a popular computer um, science verification tool, to verify that, um, for example, in a fundraising uh, smart contract, the money will not send to the wrong hands or with the wrong amount. So that kind of uh, high-level verification goes beyond just testing or auditing. Because in testing and auditing, we're basically you know, using heuristics to understand whether specific problems will occur. But here we can say like, it's not about this problem will not occur, it's about certain things will always hold, uh, regardless of what kind of inputs uh, we may receive in invoking the smart contracts. So this is the uh, ID of Scylla. Um, by the way, everything is open source. I just got a question from the audience uh, before this talk. So Zilliqa is open source. Scylla Interpreter is open source. All, everything is there on GitHub, and you are, you are welcome to check it out. And then more importantly, we have a 3 o'clock workshop today, um, you know, right at this conference. Uh, our developers will show you how to program in Scylla, if you are interested. So I briefly explain how do we run smart contracts both faster and safer. Now let's come back to that game we discussed in the beginning, Ethereum. So uh, Ethereum found that maybe it's not a sustainable way to keep running their battling functions uh, on, um, on Ethereum because it's very costly um, in terms of performance, in terms of uh, gas fee. So we are working with them very closely at the moment. Uh, we are ex going to explore whether they can run the most uh, heavy options, operations of their games on Zilliqa as a sort of faster and safer platform. So in future, we will welcome all sorts of you know, games and other applications who are requiring high throughput and high security to sort of test out Zilliqa as, as a more viable platform for the future. So with that, I would like to thank, uh, uh, thank everyone for your attention. Uh, do we have a Q&A session? Or? Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hands. The question is, how do we differentiate between uh, type two and type three transactions? Oh, okay. Let me try to go back to the slide. Uh, so these categorizations are really just, you know, uh, for the ring term. We are going to have more, um, more finer grand uh, divisions in the future. But at the moment, type two is pretty straightforward. Type two is very specific in terms of having one user account uh, calling one function into one smart contract. So that's very specific. Yeah, if the call, right, it, it will be type three. If, or if the can potentially call, uh, it will be type three because maybe you are referring to static and dynamic analysis, right? So we just take the more conservative approach. If you have any call in your code that may potentially result to another call to a smart contract, then they, they belong to type three. Of course, in future, as I said, the nodes can be smarter. The nodes can, can you know, sort of understand uh, what kind of things um, that may happen in the wrong time. And then the clients may say, hey, I don't think this, this smart contract will call another smart contract, right? So they will be processed faster as type two. Um, if that's the case, that's all good. But if suddenly during execution, the nodes found out that uh, this transaction actually will invoke a further call to another smart contract, it will sort of be rejected in that way and be processed in, the, in, the, in a slower way. But then in that sense, maybe you, are, you have wasted your guess. Thank <laughs> you.